So Ga has given me the impossible task of trying to follow that. Um, I'm not sure I'll live up to it, but I'll try. So in this session, we'll talk about society, a topic that has come up throughout the day, including in Ga's th uh, talk, and came up in Shakir's talk in the morning. In particular, we'll talk about visions uh, we might have for a society going forward. And so it's fitting that we're having this conversation here at HIGH, uh, institute founded basically on having a vision for how humans and AI could function in a, a society, you know, founded by two luminaries in Fei Fei and uh, John H. Mendy. And so it's also befitting that we have uh, four pioneers here who have all uh, produced very compelling, bold, and imaginative visions uh, of AI and how we might imagine it going forward. So in particular, uh, let me introduce the four speakers. Uh, rather than doing the sort of standard thing of listing their many uh, accolades and achievements, which uh, you know, I could do, but probably is too long, let me just say something about each of the four of them I find particularly inspiring. So I'll start with Eric. Eric is a professor here, uh, and he leads the uh, Digital Economy Lab, making influential contributions and shaping our understanding of how technology affects the economy. And I think one of the things I find really interesting about Eric is actually every time uh, I'm in a, a talk or seminar uh, with him, he asks these very incisive and sort of very pure questions. And so maybe it's befitting that today I'll be asking him the questions. Uh, Jaron Lanier is the prime unifying scientist at Microsoft, having made many contributions to VR, the internet, and probably any number of other technologies uh, that you've all heard of. Um, and uh, Jaron's work has a very interesting quality to it, that he often asks, uh, or he questions assumptions that most of us don't even realize are assumptions in what's going on in the world. And so it really uh, looks at really what are the most fundamental things that we can question and reshape and rethink. June Park is a PhD student here uh, in computer science doing leading work at the intersection of HCI and AI. And June gives these very beautiful talks with these beautiful slides all the time. Uh, but, but something you might not know is June is also an oil painter, and I recommend uh, you check out his website and learn about uh, his beautiful artwork. And Aisha Wilson uh, has flown across the country uh, from MIT to be here today, where she's a professor, and her group looks at the intersection of society, algorithms, and AI. And Aisha's work um, across uh, both her PhD here, or in the Bay in Berkeley, and now has a very interesting sort of theoretical character to it, where she has these very deep uh, insights, whether they're mathematical or maybe today philosophical in nature. So with that, maybe Eric, you could take it away. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks, Rishi. And uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, pulling together this amazing, amazing group here. And I think it was great that you had me go right after Goethe, because uh, I'm going to very much build on some of the inspirational things. It was great when he came to Stanford High, and, and we're talking about creativity. And what I want to talk about is that we are at a fork in the road right now, and I'm going to lay it out from the perspective of an economist uh, between the vision that Geb put, put forward and the vision that, frankly, most managers, most entrepreneurs, most policymakers, even most technologists are pursuing, which is very much focused on using AI to automate and imitate humans. And I call that the Turing trap. So, let me start the story about uh, what, 73 years ago with this guy. As you, as you probably know, he wrote this very influential uh, article. And it says up here that it's uh, based on the imitation game, which is the idea that the measure of intelligence is how close you can make a machine imitate a human, how close it could mimic what we did. And I remember when I was a kid, I thought, that's kind of a neat idea. It makes sense. But the closer we get to it, and we are getting very close to it now, maybe even have achieved it in some dimensions, I'm realizing it was the wrong goal all along. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, it actually didn't even start with him. 2,500 years ago, the mythical engineer Daedalus purportedly made robots that could walk and talk like humans. And of course, you know, Carol Chapek uh, coined the term robot about 100 years ago. We're beginning to see some robots that are increasingly humanoid. And, and we've heard today about machines that can do a lot of seemingly creative work, at least in some domains. Um, one metric that you could look at is you go to a site like Metaculus, and you see that um, achieving 
general intelligence, whatever that exactly means, at Metaculus, one of the definitions has to do with passing a two-hour Turing test, was something that most people, the majority of people, uh, experts surveyed, thought was far off, 2059, 2060. That was two years ago. Now, people are predicting that it's less than 10 years away. So those timelines have come in a lot closer. So we need to take seriously, what does it mean if we do create human-like intelligence? And let me lay out what I call the 10 theses of the Turing trap, and then I'll illustrate them a little bit. The first one is that I want to be clear. There are a lot of benefits to human-like intelligence. We could have vast wealth. Uh, we could have a lot more leisure time. And as Surya and others have pointed out, we could have a better understanding of our own minds. So that's, there's definitely some benefits from that. But not all types of AI are human-like. That's not, it's a mistake to think that those are synonyms. There are many kinds of intelligence. My calculator is far better at doing arithmetic than I or probably anyone in this room. Chimpanzees apparently have better short-term memory than any of us. Bats, octopuses, they all have different kinds of intelligence. But if you do make a machine that's human-like, that has intelligence very similar to the kind of intelligence that we humans do, then from an economist's perspective, you're going to make a machine that is a better and better substitute for what we do. It can better replace us. OK? Well, it turns out that substitutes will drive down wages. When two things are substitutes are competing with each other, they will drive down wages. And so when you have things that can calculate at you know, fractions of a penny, things that might take us hours or days, that's going to drive down wages. As it drives down wages, it's going to reduce our economic power and the uh, political power of those people who were workers previously doing those kinds of tasks. That will take away our agency and our power to change the outcome. The people who have lost their power will now not be in a good position to change that outcome. So you can see how that's a self-reinforcing trap. I could call it the Turing trap in homage to Alan Turing. Um, but I also want to be clear, as we heard from Gay and others today, that there are other ways of using the technology. It doesn't have to be used to make an imitation or a substitute of humans. You can also use AI to augment what we do, to increase our creativity and spur it. That's a different path. If you do that, the economics are very different. It turns out that that tends to increase wages. Now, most people instinctively think of machines as replacing workers. But the real history of economic progress is that most machines have augmented what we can do. You can just look at wages. A couple hundred years ago, people worked for 1 30th or 1 50th per hour what people work today. So we have mostly been augmenting humans, not replacing or substituting for humans. There's been some of each, to be clear. But it's been broadly a story of augmentation and increased creativity. Creativity not only allows you to do more of the same, but more importantly, allows you to do new things, create new goods and services and new uh, innovations. So that's good, these two paths. The thing that I'm worried about, though, is when I look at the economics, there's right now clearly excess incentives for one path versus the other. There's not a balance. In particular, technologists, policymakers, managers, entrepreneurs, if I look close at them, each of them have too much of an incentive to replace or augment humans and not enough of incentive to augment or create new things. And that is leading us to a, uh, a less than optimal path, or maybe even a very dangerous path. Let me walk through that a little bit. First, let me give you a little illustration. I mentioned Daedalus earlier. Suppose that he wasn't a myth. Suppose that he had succeeded. And suppose he had taken his task very narrowly. My job is to imitate humans and have my robots do exactly what humans are doing in ancient Greece. Great. We would be able to have as many clay pots as we want. We could fill the room with clay pots. We could all have tunics automatically made, zero labor cost. If we, our horse-drawn carts were broken, automatically replaced. If you got sick, no problem. The robot would burn incense for you. Now, you can quickly see that having piles of clay pots and burning incense and no labor, I mean, in a way, it's nice. You know, we'd have a lot of leisure. But our living standards wouldn't be anywhere near what we have today with mRNA vaccines and jet planes and uh, iPhones, et cetera. So simply doing the same things that we were doing back then is not sufficient to raise things. You can do this a little bit more formally. 
One very simple equation is the equation for productivity. Productivity, by definition, is output divided by input. Uh, usually, economists think of that as GDP per hour worked. Now, if you send hours to zero, what happens to productivity? You guys can do the math. It's pretty good, right? Productivity soars. It goes to infinity. Um, what happens to labor income? Oh, that's not so good. Labor income goes to zero. So by this simple analysis, you can see that productivity is great. It's wonderful to have productivity, but even infinite productivity isn't the be-all and end-all of things if, if you simply maintain the same level of output as before. I mean, it's not bad to have leisure. I'm not against it. But it's, there's more to, to uh, improving the economy than that. Now, as I mentioned, I said three groups have excess incentives. Those are policymakers, business executives, and technologists. So policymakers, let's look at them first. Suppose we have two different entrepreneurs, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob both have a brilliant idea, each have a brilliant idea to create a billion dollars worth of value, like many of you in this room, no doubt. Um, Alice's idea will employ 1,000 workers. Bob's idea employs no workers, just machines. What does the tax system do? Well, it turns out that one of these groups is going to pay far more taxes than the other. One of these ventures is going to pay over twice as much taxes as the other. And one of the first rules of taxation is whatever you tax more of, you tend to get less of. So intentionally or not, we have put our thumb on the scale to have less of Alice's kind of work uh, venture and more of Bob's kind of venture, even if they create the same total value. Entrepreneurs and, and managers also have excess incentives to do substitution. When you sub use a machine to substitute for human labor, you create value, and that's good. You make the pie bigger. Absolutely, we like that. You also shift the pie. You rearrange the pie. Less goes to workers, more goes to capital owners. Capital owners win two ways, and they're going to have excess incentives. They're going to want to do that even if it doesn't make the pie bigger, even if it's not particularly beneficial. So we have a consistent bias in the decision makers when they decide whether to automate things. And finally, I think technologists often also make this mistake. The Institute for Human-Centered AI was founded to try to counter this, but oftentimes I think there's a, a kind of a lazy approach of like, let's look at what a human is doing, let's look at what a machine is, uh, and see if we can make a machine do the same thing as what a human is doing. But that's not nearly ambitious enough. Um, if you look at the white circle there, that's all the tasks that humans are doing. And a lot of work is focused on expanding the black oval there to have it take up more and more of what humans can do. And we look at all the things we can, humans can do and say, hey, can we make a machine do that? But the, the hatched area there is much bigger. And this is not drawn to scale. There are so many things that have never been done before by human or machine that potentially could be done. Of course, those are much harder to imagine because they haven't existed before. So there's a bias. We look at what exists and think, can we automate it? We should be thinking what has not yet existed. Admittedly, that's a harder task. I would also say that in some ways, automating what humans do is too ambitious. Too ambitious because it actually can be very hard to do some of the things that people do, like buttoning a shirt or walking up the stairs or a lot of simple tasks that a three-year-old or five-year-old can do are actually surprisingly difficult to get a machine to do. And a ton of effort is spent on getting machines to do those things that we already have entities that can do them perfectly well. So let me just wrap up by saying we have two paths ahead of us. We can focus on AI in the traditional sense that so many people focus on, which is using it to do what humans do. I looked up the definition of AI and said doing tasks that humans can do intelligently. Or we can focus on intelligence augmentation. This is Doug Engelbart, who spent some time at Stanford. And 10 years after Alan Turing, he made the case that we should be taking that second path. So let me just close by saying neither of these paths are preordained. We can choose the path of substitution, automation, replacing humans that Alan Turing laid out as the vision. Or we can take the path of augmenting and creativity that so many people here at Stanford High have been focusing on. And as the machines become more and more powerful, by definition, by definition, that means we have more power to change the world than we ever had before. And I think that also by definition means 
that our values are more important than ever before. So I'm urging those of you who are listening to think about that and where appropriate, choose that second path of augmentation and creativity rather than merely substitution and automation. Thanks very much. So cool, Eric. I love your work. Really, really great. Okay, so I'm Jaron Lanier. Um, I'm the prime unifying scientist at Microsoft. That's actually a joke, because uh, I'm in the office of the chief technology officer, and it spells out octopus. And I used to study cephalopod cognition and then grew tentacles, and you know, so that's, <laughs> I'm the octopus. All right, so long before I was the octopus, uh, in the late 70s into early 80s, um, I worked as a very young researcher for a certain Marvin Minsky, who is probably the one person who did the most to set up the culture of AI as we have it. With others, with McCarthy, with Turing certainly, but he, he did a lot. And I used to give him hell for it. I was, his, I was his only mentee who just never accepted it. And uh, when I finally, the last time I saw him just before he died, he said, can we have the argument again? He really liked having a kid who disagreed with him. So the nature of our disagreement was just because people like Turing have argued that you can think of machines as being intelligent or human-like doesn't mean that you can also think differently. There's, there's no disallowance. In fact, I like to think of it as like an M.C. Escher drawing where there's a figure ground inversion that's possible. So for large model AI, the inversion, which is equally valid from a strictly conceptual or abstract point of view, is that these systems are not entities in themselves, but rather new forms of collaboration between people. And the people are the sources of the training data and the algorithms and the prompts and the fine tuning. You can look at the whole thing as a human collaboration if you want. It's not the most popular way to think about it. You might even think it's weird or awkward to think that way, but I hope you'll admit that it's logically as, as logically valid to think that way. So I'm into that. I like thinking of it that way. If you want to get a summary, I can recommend uh, that you take a look at a piece I wrote for the New Yorker magazine a few months back called There Is No AI, which presents this argument. Now, what I want to do is give you a variety of examples where I believe we see benefits if we think this way. And I want to emphasize, if you think this way, it might not change a line of code, but it might change how you integrate what the code means in your own brain, in the economy, in society. So it might have an impact on the larger system in which the code operates. But in itself, you can use the same code and think of it either way. So I'm trying to decide whether to go in to the out or out to the in. Uh, I'm gonna start out in, meaning the very biggest cultural setting, and then I'm gonna move into a much more narrow issue about model quality and performance improvement, all right? And I'm going to do it probably in three steps in the interest of time. In the biggest picture, I think we have a real problem with how technology and science and the new type of wealth that accrues to those of us who are good at it, I think we have a problem with how this is fitting into the larger world. I think the way we talk about what we're doing scares a lot of people for no reason, makes them feel small, which is even worse. I mean, imagine that you're out far from here. You're driving a truck in Bolivia or something. You listen to the news and you hear somebody who runs a big AI company says, well, we're building these things that'll get smarter than people. They might destroy the world, but they probably won't. We won't, none of us will have to do anything because we'll be made obsolete, but we'll train it so it likes us and it'll take good care of us. Now, that's not an exaggeration. We say stuff like that all the time. We've said it again and again. It's gotten a little bit better lately, with, but, but you know, earlier this year, lots of people said it. Um, and uh, how do you think that makes somebody feel out there? You know, now, if you say, well, it's too bad how they feel because it's the truth, not really, because remember, there's an equally valid alternate way to, to parse this. If it's really also equally valid, a collaboration of humans, then saying these things is really counterproductive. One thing I'll note is that all over the world now, let's say, people have been mean and crazy since the dawn of recorded history. We know that. But the flavor these days 
is often about trying to hold on to some bit of human identity. And I really have to say this is true both on the right and the left, the West and the East, the religious and the secular. People kind of latch on to something that says, this is me as a human, this is my identity. And then they, they kind of cling to it in a way that sometimes is maybe dysfunctionally intense. I'm not going to go into examples of that. I'd probably get in deep trouble with somebody, but I hope if you run it through in your head, you might see what I'm talking about. Uh, I think part of that is coming from tech communication having a negative impact on the world very broadly, not just in one sector, just everywhere outside of here where we all make a lot of money and we don't feel insecure about our futures. Now, let's, what would it look like if we were thinking of these systems as collaborations instead of new entities? A few things. One is that we'd probably add some code to the systems to keep track of human contributions. The current nature, not only of AI, but of many collaborative systems online, is designed to kind of forget the people. For instance, the World Wide Web, pro well, this, isn't, this, this wasn't uh, Tim's intent, but the World Wide Web protocol is a one-way link, not a two-way link, so you don't remember where things came from. In the early days, if you talked to people designing networks, including our wonderful Doug Engelbart, they would have said, no, you need two-way links so you know who did what. People need credit, they need to take responsibility. The whole future economy is gonna depend on knowing who did what to some degree if they wanna be known. And if you have only one-way links, everything just turns abstract and you never know what anything is. And truth will go away. I've been hearing that since the 70s. This truth thing is not a new problem, the reality collapse problem. Uh, so we would have to start keeping track of where things came from, at the very least, within our large models. And I would like us to do it on the internet as a whole as well. And this is a long discussion. But let's say we kept track. Uh, here's a conjecture. The conjecture is that if we had a ranking, not only an influence function for a given segment of input data for a large model, I, if, I, so, if I say something that sounds too technical, just yell, say, don't be so technical, and I'll change, because I don't know how technical everybody is here, but it's Stanford, so you probably all are. Um, but <laughs> uh, if you, you want both influence, but you also want fungibility, which is to say, are there a million other things that, that would function in the same way, or is it kind of uniquely able to function in the way it did? Is its influence unique? If you can combine those two things and you have a function, the conjecture is that the number of key antecedent segments of information or documents relevant to a given output that's treated as var variable will be small. And in the times I've been able to test it, it seems to often be like around a dozen or something. That's extremely interesting because that means that it's not always a billion that are equal. It is for something like sentence structure. That's a billion sources that are e equal or more. But for most things, it's not. In that case, it means there's an opening for a new societal structure that could come about. Uh, one way we might want to use this is to incentivize people to fill in gaps in training data. I'll give you an example of that. In, uh, if you try to use large language models to build virtual worlds automatically, which I'm sure some people here are doing, it's great fun, I love it. It's so fun uh, to just ask for stuff and have it pop up in virtual reality. But the thing is, it's a little different from asking for a new website. Because there have been so many websites programmed and up on GitHub that you can ask the GPT as an example for a website and it'll do a pretty good job. To get a virtual world, not so much. The quality of output from a model tends to track the volume and quality of re relevant input data when it was trained, right? That's not a tough claim. So what if you could incentivize people to add more good data? Now here's where something gets very interesting, which, is, which um, relates very much to Eric's last point, which I'm a very strong believer in. If you think we already kind of know how the world should be and we just want to optimize for that, that's one thing. But if you think there's an infinite frontier of new things we might want to do, then you can imagine new communities coming along and being incentivized to create more and more new bodies of training data to enable large models to do new things that hadn't been imagined before better. That to me is extremely interesting and here's why. A lot of my colleagues in the tech world believe in the universal basic income as a solution. We will uh, we'll do everything, not too many people will need to work at the same level, most people won't earn a lot of money, but we'll make this universal basic income. 
my friend Sam Altman has these big balls you're supposed to stare into to get your crypto token for your basic income in the future. I love, I love Sam, but no. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the problem with that for me is A, it's depressing because people won't feel needed and that's fundamentally not honest or workable. B, anytime you have a central authority divvying up the, the, the you know, social welfare, the worst actors realize they should cede that. You start with Bolsheviks, you end up with Stalinists. It happens over and over and over again. It's not politically viable. You need a jumble of different societal institutions. You want to read somebody about that, read de Tocqueville, excellent on that topic. Hannah Arendt, excellent on that topic. Uh, but then also, um, if you, believe, if you think that way, you sort of believe that every kind of problem we need to solve is already gonna somehow be in there based on the training data, and the thing will get super intelligent and train itself in the future. Well, even we don't do that. I mean, that's a conjecture, but it's, it's not a supported one. Wouldn't it be better whenever there's an opportunity to create a new creative class instead of a new dependent class? a new class of people who programmed tree trimming robots to, who might one year make holographic topiary and another year topiary that fights climate change or God knows, there might be fashions. It becomes like fashion. It becomes infinite instead of finite. You enter what's called an infinite game instead of a finite game, which is a book by James P. Kars you should read that games are either finite or infinite and culture must be infinite to be anything. So this takes what we're doing and turns it into an infinite game instead of one that has an asymptotic des destination. I have, I have six seconds, um, but you ran over a little bit. I'm gonna do just slightly. Uh, <laughs> there's another aspect of this which I really like. Uh, one of the problems we have is that sometimes our large models present outputs that we don't like, that displease us. They might hallucinate, uh, they might just have low quality. Um, they might simply be irrelevant or ridiculous. No, we work to improve that. But what we really don't want is for them to be harmful. And when we try to mitigate potential harms, there are a few strategies, and I think they're all worthwhile. I'm not speaking against any of them. One of them is to try to train them along the lines of Isaac Asimov's old laws of robotics to be decent. And so these are the alignment and fairness uh, type, type, of, type of projects, great. Another one we can do is we can do, re reduce the number of cycles of interaction somebody has with a model because the longer you interact with it, the longer the session memory starts to compete with the original training and increase the chances of hallucinations. So we have to do that with general access GPT, otherwise, you know, the bots will keep on asking people to leave their spouses and stuff, as, as has happened <laughs> before we started doing that. <clears throat> um, there's another way, which I think is better. Um, I worked on privacy law in the EU for a long time, and after about 10 years, I realized we didn't know what privacy was. And that turned into something called the GDPR, which is this European law for privacy, which does some good, is a little bit awkward, and maybe dysfunctional in some ways. But the thing is, nobody quite knows what it is. And I don't think we quite know what alignment is or what fairness is. I just don't think we know what these things really are. But what we can know is we can say, if there's a malicious user or an incompetent user or a fake user, whatever, that is affecting model output, we can suppress the contribution of those sources into the output to improve the output. Just like in any engineering function, we know that only some ranges of inputs yield useful outputs. In fluid dynamics, the best equations blow up with some inputs, so we don't use those inputs. It's very simple. We could start doing the same thing if we knew which inputs were doing what, and I believe we can by innovating the training process to set up the traces to make that a viable thing to analyze in real time efficiently. All right, uh, I think I have to stop, but uh, this overall program <laughs> is sometimes called Data Dignity. Last night at dinner, a certain Stanford, no, it was a Google person was objecting to the name, and I said, well, Sachin and Adela made it up, so, you know, we're using it. And so, <laughs> that's not to say it's official Microsoft policy, but I'm, I'm uh, an advocate of this approach, and I believe we can improve the world by taking it. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. All right. <laughs>
Fantastic. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, I'll take a now slightly different term, but also very much related, where now I'm going to talk about HCI and NLP ML and really to discuss what new forms of interaction we can create by leveraging the latest technologies from NLP and machine learning. And for that, I'll start from here. <clears throat> for decades, we have envisioned the ability to create believable simulacra of human behavior, computer-generated behavior that is so compelling and so human-like that it provides an illusion of life. In our vision, this ability if achieved would promise a new class of interactive applications ranging from human behavior models for usability testing to social robots and NPCs that would populate our virtual worlds, and even to the foundation of social simulations that would test our social scientific theories and economic policies that are too difficult to validate in real life. But despite these promises, there remained a fundamental challenge when simulating human behavior, the space of possibility in the way we behave and communicate, we found, was much too vast and too complex for us to recreate. Today, I'm going to introduce a new way of simulating human behavior in fully general computational agents by fusing a large language model like ChatGPT with a novel agent architecture that can remember, reflect, and plan based on constantly growing memories and cascading social dynamics. These agents I'm going to demonstrate can not only plan and lead a believable day in life where they wake up in the morning, do their routines, and go to work as individuals in a sandbox game environment without any hard-coded scripts, but they can also come together to give birth to an entire artificial society of their own like this, where they talk to each other to share information, form relationships, and coordinate activities before reflecting on the past to decide how they will live tomorrow. And we named what we created generative agents. And these generative agents I'm going to suggest open up a new genre in human AI interaction that is fueled by our newfound ability to simulate human behavior. So, let me officially welcome you to Smallville. This is a setting of our demonstration. What you see here is a map of a game world that we developed called Smallville. And though it may look and feel like a game that you and I may have played as a child, Smallville features all the common affordances that are found in a typical small village. There are houses, apartments, stores, a cafe, bars, school, as well as there are sub-areas and objects that make the space functional, like a living room, bathroom, and a kitchen in a family house, as well as a bookshelf and a table in the living room. And we populated this space with 25 generative agents, each with distinct identities that we've given them, described in one paragraph of English sentences. So for instance, we told Isabella that she's the cafe owner of Hobbs Cafe who loves to make people feel welcome, and that she's planning to organize a Valentine's Day party. And with that as the only human input, we are able to simulate believable lives for these agents. So this is what a typical day looks like for Isabella, for instance. In broad strokes, she wakes up early and completes her morning routine around 6 a.m. and prepares to open her cafe by 8. She notices and interacts with her customers throughout the day, perhaps even inviting them to the party that she's planning. And around 6 p.m., her working day comes to an end as she, as she heads to a local store to buy supplies. And in closer, we can see that these broad stroke behaviors are actually composed of smaller sequences of actions. So if, for instance, Isabella thought to herself, I want to make coffee, she would first check that her cup is cleaned, then turn on the coffee machine, and occupy one of the empty chairs in her cafe as she waits for her co coffee to finish brewing. Meanwhile, as a collective, in this practically a small society of generative agents, this society is marked by the emergence of societal behaviors that mirror those of our human societies. Take a look at this interaction between Latoya and Sam, for instance. At the start of the simulation, these two are strangers, but over time, they remember their interactions with one another, and they form a relationship. The first time they meet is while taking a walk in a park. They introduce themselves, and Latoya tells Sam that she's here to take photos for the project that she's working on. And the next day, when Sam sees Latoya again, he remembers her as well as her project and asks, Hi, Latoya. How's your project going? To which Latoya responds, hi, Sam. It's going well. 
But it's not just these one-on-one -on -one interactions that take place in Smallville. Remember from earlier that we planted in Isabella's initial identity that she's planning to organize a Valentine's Day party. Over time in the simulation, that seed we planted in Isabella causes her to invite others to the party and even enlist Maria to help her decorate the cafe. And later that day, Maria in turn asks Klaus, her secret crush, to go to the party with her. And on the day of Valentine's, five agents, including Maria and Klaus, actually show up at Hobbs Cafe to enjoy the festivities, while others choose not to or some simply forget, as we sometimes do in our lives. But that's not all. In Smallville, you do not have to be a mere passive observer of these agents. Instead, you can interact with them. You can change their environment, burn their toast, and watch them rush to put out the fire and remake their breakfast. So th there you see Wolfgang trying to put out the fire. Or command the agents by planting new ideas, by rewriting their memories. So here we're telling John that he's now planning to run for mayor. And we can watch him share his candidacy with his family. Or you can enter the simulation yourself to directly talk and communicate with these agents. Hi, Isabella. Hi, June. How are you? Great. I'm giving a talk about you. Do you want to say hi to the audience? <laughs> Happy to. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed June's talk. And don't forget to swing by Hobbs Cafe. We'd love to see you there. Have a fantastic time. Thank you, Isabella. So how did we achieve this agent behavior? What makes generative agents possible today is the development of large language models like ChatGPT. My observation here is that these models are trained on broad data that reflects our lives, like the traces from our social web, Wikipedia, and more. So as a result of that, they encode a tremendous amount about us, how we live, talk, and behave. So when given a narrowly defined situation, they can be used to generate believable human behavior. But there is a challenge. We humans perceive a lifetime of experiences, remember and make sense of them, and translate them into ground directions that represent us. But this is not what a language model does. A language model doesn't remember no reason beyond their current interaction with you. And they operate in natural language that is detached from our physical reality. So how can we still leverage the richness of a language model to simulate human behavior? Here's how. First, we translate the perceptual stimuli of our agents into natural language sentences. So in the case of what Isabella perceived at her cafe, it might be phrases like Maria is chatting with Klaus or the chair is empty. We then store these phrases in their natural language format in a long-term memory module that we call the memory stream. And we retrieve from it only a small subset of the memories that are most relevant to responding to the agent's current situation. So if Isabella is asked, what are you excited about? She might retrieve memories that are about her Valentine's Day party. We would then use the retrieved memories to generate plans, actions, and reflections for these agents using a, larger, using a language model. And what we find in evaluation is that these generative agents that are fully equipped with the agent architecture that I proposed here produces behavior that is significantly more believable than both ChatGPT and even the human crowd workers role-playing as these agents. So today, I presented to you generative agents. And within them, the power to create AIs, they can understand and express human behavior. And now, as I end my talk, I want to leave you with a vision for where I want to take these agents in the future. Just as portraits illustrate our images, generative agents simulate our lives. But that doesn't mean they're people. To me, our family, friends, and communities will always be and should be the central way in which we experience our lives. But their ability to create accurate simulations of our behavior may help us better understand ourselves in situations where direct observation or engagement is not possible like when we need to anticipate the outcomes of social scientific theories that operate on such a vast scale, 
or predicted consequences of social and economic policies that may impact millions? I believe these are the questions that generative agents can help us answer so that they may empower us to better navigate the complex world that we live in today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I believe I am the last one of the session, which is good. I'll try and keep it uh, brief, uh, not run over. Um, so today, I wanted to talk with you about algorithmic pluralism. And it starts with this observation and nicely dovetails off this talk, um, the talks that were given about how algorithms are being used to allocate many, if not most, of the opportunities we have today. So as an example, it decides or is assisting in deciding who is seen and how they're represented, who is centered in the design process, and it's also central to a lot of resource allocations, so enrichment opportunities, economic opportunities, even certain direct freedom opportunities. So it is quite important, even if they're just merely assisting humans in the decision-making to understand and plan for how they interact with these humans. So I teach a class at MIT, and part of that class is a discussion about what societal values we have. And so we list several of them, free speech, privacy, and one of them is equality. Um, there's this idea that's central to a lot of democratic societies that all persons have equal moral worth and therefore should be treated equally in some way. But it's still unclear, and a lot of societies disagree about what exactly should be made equal. Should it be welfare, esteem, material goods, capacities. I think a lot of what we've centered on is this idea that opportunities should be equal in some way. Indeed, opportunities are considered foundational to our sense of freedom. And we have laws that provide constraints on how opportunities are allocated. These allocations, for example, should be made based off features that are perhaps relevant to the goal of the allocation and not arbitrary in some way. And so we've designed, at least legally, and even normatively, these barriers on what we think should be guiding these allocations. A lot of philosophers have flocked in to try and formalize this, economists as well. There's been a lot of discussion about what constitutes fair decision making uh, and preservation of equal opportunity. And so, Formally speaking, a lot of the way we set this up is that we petition features or factors in our decision making into these sets of meritus and non-meritus for a particular allocation. And we say that perhaps the chances of success for any one allocation should be independent of the features that don't constitute merit. There have been a lot of philosophers who've discussed this partitioning um, and talked about its impossibility, both normatively as well as the dissatisfaction in this formal fairness formulation in terms of actually ensuring freedom when it comes to equal partitions. Uh, famous philosopher Bernard Williams has this nice thought experiment of this warrior society where there's this one battle that determines all future opportunities at age 14. And this highlights how even when opportunities could be made equal, it's not necessarily desirable to have all, all uh, potential flows of resources go based on one, op uh, one sorry, opportunity allocation. So what we did is take this framework of Joseph Fishkin. He's a historian and economist. Um, and he has this idea of a more structural view of equal opportunity, that opportunities should be structured so that there is a plurality of pathways resulting in a material good. In particular, it's important not just to consider formally a decision at hand, but the broad patterns of life chances and pathways, as well as repeated encounters with the decision-making system. So let's talk about what this would actually mean, what a structural approach to equal opportunity is. And in particular, let's talk about it in the context of what might threaten it. 
There's this idea that's been surfaced in some of the uh, community for machine learning. It's this idea of an algorithmic monoculture. Let's take hiring, for example. In today's society, hiring practices are grossly unequal. Everyone knows this. But there's some inherent stochasticity in terms of how opportunities are allocated. If I'm an applicant, I might apply to many hiring jobs, and they decide independently whether to hire me or not. However, today, we have algorithms, data-driven algorithms, assisting us in these allocations. And so algorithmic monoculture can be just understood as a state in which many decision makers that collectively dominate as a sector all rely on the same or similar algorithms. Higher view, as an example, assists in 60% of the top Fortune 100 companies um, in its decision making. So it is quite remarkably dominating a lot of uh, sectors. The potential structural equal opportunity concern is that allocations will become standardized by enforcing the same classification on the same applicant file every time it's encountered at scale. So we have this intuitive notion that concentration that can happen in terms of power and decision making could be potentially enabled by algorithmic systems. And it does seem as though this might be a concern that is happening or bearing itself today. This is even the case for foundation models. Indeed, a lot of, uh, a lot of downstream tasks adapt the same foundation model. Um, and this has the potential to create a single point of failure. And so what we really wanted to understand, well, first, is to what extent are opportunities made less plural because of algorithmic decision making? Indeed, today, for a lot of models, there's a lot of shared components. And this is a matter of best epistemic best practice. So we share models, data sets, libraries, evaluations. And the sharing of these components potentially creates the standard, or does create a standardization. But what we want to understand is how much of this homogenization across the components results in homogenization across outcomes for people. And secondly, what are potential statistical mechanisms for increasing plurality? What are the trade-offs? Should we even be doing this in the first place? Perhaps we should deploy our legal apparatus to step in, potentially in the case of hiring as well, as we have a lot of laws governing how hiring practices can operate. So I want to highlight several works that have happened here at HAI um, that have provided evidence for homogenization in a variety of allocations. And what the metric they use to determine whether this homogenization is taking place, well, there are two. The first is systemic rejection, the average probability that individuals are rejected by all models, and trying to measure whether this is going up, as well as systemic failure, the average probability that individuals receive inaccurate outcomes across all models. An example of what appears in one of these papers, and indeed there are several experiences, far too many for me to go through in this uh, short talk, um, is an example that comes from a skin cancer prediction where we have uh, systemic failures that are increased, and in particular in this example, for a lot of darker skin tones. So you'll see this homogenization effect where all the models agree um, inaccurately, um, for the most case, when, when, uh, for, for you know, populations that are already quite vulnerable. So what I want to end with is a recommendation for perhaps a, initiative, a research initiative, for trying to understand whether it's possible to increase plurality without sacrificing perhaps some of the other normative things we like, like accuracy, um, with respect to a particular problem formulation. I don't think this is always something that should be done. And indeed, I think there are contexts in which we might want to actually limit the use of algorithms for particular allocations. But what me and my group are working on is showing that there are indeed ways to utilize randomness that is inherent already in our decision making to perhaps randomize what higher view is showing each company so that systemic uh, homogen this homogenization is decreased. 
Um, so for example, there's a common statistical technique called the bootstrap, whereby we subsample. And if we uh, subsample to generate different models to get a sense of our uh, out of sample uh, generalization, and if we use this bootstrapping idea to indeed randomize, we get very similar accuracy, or like the same accuracy, but reduced homogenization. So too, if we deploy other ways of quantifying uncertainty, like conformal prediction or randomizing near the threshold. So this is just some examples of ways that we might tackle this potential societal problem. But indeed, I think more research is needed uh, in this area. And so what I want to end with is that I think algorithmic plurality, this idea that we should avoid homogenization, particularly with certain resource allocations, is important to preserving a notion of structural equal opportunity. And I think there are many future research questions, which I would encourage a lot of people in this community to perhaps pursue. There's been a lot of initial work on measuring the degree of homogenization, but this can only be done for things in which we have transparent uh, decision-making rules. And so ideally, we can continue to do this for a lot of other sectors. And I also want to understand how we achieve plurality, perhaps using statistical tools alone or other mechanisms. Maybe we design AI to assist us in different ways so we don't have this homogenization effect. But what are the trade-offs? Um, and indeed, I'm really interested in this idea of how do we balance plurality with other societal values that we hold dear. With that, I will end um, and take it over to Rishi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great. So what I'll do is ask uh, all four of the speakers a series of questions, and then we'll break into uh, audience Q&A. So maybe to start, I'll ask uh, all four of you the same question, but sort of tailor it to your specific talk. So to me, all four talks have a central point about measurement across them, right? So in Eric's, you know, there's the Turing test an attempt to measure things, and maybe it's faulty, so what should the test be for how we assess AI? In data dignity, you know, we're thinking about the value of data. You mentioned influence functions. How do we you know, quantify this, this value data might have? For June, you know, when we're talking about simulacra, we're, what, how should we evaluate them today, and what are even better evaluations we might look for tomorrow? And then for Aisha, you know, when we talk about Fishkin's theory, uh, in particular, we know this notion of the severity of bottlenecks. How do you measure how severe a bottleneck is, and how do you know when it's too severe? So maybe you can go down the line in that order. Sure. Um, I think this is a, that's a great question. It's really important for us to rethink some of our metrics to go beyond the Turing test in particular. Um, there's an a, a, a iconic paper by Niels Nielsen here at Stanford that said that the true test of intelligence was to go through every single task that humans do and systematically see whether on a machine can do those tasks. And that's very much amplifying the problems of the Turing test. We've been meeting, uh, Fei-Fei Li and I and, and a number of other people getting together to think about whether we could come up with an alternative that had humans and machines working together. I want to be very frank, we, I don't think we've cracked it yet. It, it's really hard to come up with a, something as clean as what Alan Turing came up with. But, there, but the power of these tests is, is enormous. And one of the things that we've been looking at is having teams like centaurs of humans and machines work together and not try to maximize the output of the machine itself, but how well it can do in conjunction with one or more humans working together to solve problems. And, and they can divide it amongst themselves however they want. Um, Gary Kasparov did this uh, with chess, a very narrow, constrained area, but he came up with centaur chess or freestyle chess, which for a while, the humans and machines could do much better than the machines alone, or for that matter, the humans alone. Um, and I think a generalization of that to lots of different kinds of tasks might be something that could inspire a lot of technologists. Um, I've been struck by how powerful setting a goal like that can be. Jack Clark showed me this chart. Many of you have seen similar charts where as more and more benchmarks are set up in AI, the people in this room, in this building, in this area, and around the world uh, hit those benchmarks faster and faster and faster. It's kind of scary how successful they are, but that just underscores how powerful it can be to come up with benchmarks that work towards creativity and augmentation and not just replacement. 
Um, yeah, just to that point, um, the one use case for uh, large language models that is uh, unambiguously proven effective is in helping programmers be effective, especially programmers doing work that would be tedious and not that novel uh, or, or challenging. Uh, it's been, imp like, I, I'm not aware of any measure that has below a 40% improvement in efficiency. And I, for one, think that's a really positive result because we need a lot of stuff programmed. So I, 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 I don't think we have, that's a great case of cooperation and probably more employment instead of less in the long term. I don't think it'll be true in all cases, but I love that example. To answer your question directly, okay, so this is research, and we don't know all the answers yet, but in a data dignity framework, uh, you would probably start by uh, first trying to compose uh, a Pareto peak or a, or a power law distribution of the most uh, important contributors to give an output, they'd be in two dimensions, which are influence and non-fungibility. You'd multiply those two numbers together, and then um, you would uh, combine it with some kind of uh, economic value determined in the larger uh, societal framework for how much it was worth anybody to pay for it. Um, I. <sighs> Many of my friends are profoundly anti-capitalist at this point, and I understand that, but I still think the market mechanism was sort of the first AI, the invisible hand was the first Turing thing. And uh, I, I think we have to look at the whole system, and that's where we can start to get these values, and I think it's better than um, any other thing we know about yet. Right, so in the case of Simulacra, <clears throat> so obviously the evaluation has to change given, what, given the task that you have. So in the case of Simulacra, what I promised here is the concept of believability. And that basically, to some extent, basically means it's behavior is Turing test. When you look at it, does it seem believable? Do these agents behave in a plausible manner? Now, if the promise that you want to make in the future is to use these tools to simulate our society so we can do policy testing, social science experiments, and so forth, we do have to promise something beyond that. And I, I think I echo basically all the things that Eric and Sharon just said. And in my particular instance, what I'm deeply interested in is this concept of accuracy, which basically says, does the things that happen in simulation actually replicate robustly with some statistical power in real life? And that's sort of not what we've shown at the moment, but there's a lot of sort of this small growing literature that's really delving into this topic. And I think what the community is sort of centering around right now is this idea of can these simulations or models generalized beyond what was included in its training data. So an example that, uh, that I often give is we, in the past, worked on a paper called Social Simulacra, which basically was using something like generative agents to create a new social community online so that we may prototype the social dynamics that might emerge in social computing systems. Imagine subreddits, what would happen in a new subreddit? And one evaluation that we've done in the past was, can we create a new subreddit that the language model that we are using does not know about. So the subreddit was created after the release of the language model. And can we actually recreate these new communities? And if we can, that is suggestive of, some, to some extent, the generalizability of these models and the simulations. And I think that's the direction that we're headed. I don't think the community has found sort of the answer yet in terms of how do we promise the accuracy, how do we evaluate them. But that's, I think, where the state of the art is right now. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, in this work, we talked about uh, criteria that we wanted to append to uh, the justification or, or just any kind of algorithmically assisted decision making. And one is its legitimacy. Um, that can be decomposed into its mathematical legitimacy, how accurate is it, as well as its social legitimacy. What is the justification for designing your assisted, you know, human decision making in this way? And then there's its severity, and this is where we get into this homogenization. So, well, that can be decomposed into its pervasiveness, how many people are actually impacted by this decision-making system, as well as its strictness. Is this decision-making system operate as a strict threshold? Can people, is there recourse? Are there ways for people to obtain whatever substantive good um, outside of this, this framework? And so that's typically the rubric we've set out, um, and that has been developed in part by Fishkin to, to evaluate uh, these decision-making um, points for its severity, for its uh, equal opportunity violation, and, in this, and very much in alignment with what goes on in the fairness community. Great. 
Hey, I just want to say something to, to you, which is um, I forgot in my comment. You know, the, building these uh, systems of agents, of simulacra, is exactly the way to prototype and test ideas for data dignity and to understand how economic value can emerge in a community. Uh, and in fact, in the early foundations of uh, data dignity economics, we did agent-based models with much earlier generations of agents. So I'd encourage you to look at that. I think that might be a really happy combination. That sounds fascinating. And I'll also just quickly add, we were deeply inspired by agent-based model community in general in our latest work. So this sounds like, uh, yeah, I agree. Although I have to say, back when we did that work, yeah. a lot of the prominent economists called me up and said, you know, you're working with the unpopular economists. <laughs> it was like Brian Arthur, and, you know, and, and it was kind of funny. Uh, it's funny how in academic communities, you ha it's sort of like high school, where you have like these, you know, popular groups and unpopular groups. But uh, anyway, uh, I think there's, there's a new moment arising for that. And I, I, I hope you'll look into that. I think that'd be fantastic. Eric? Absolutely. Let me just build on, on that. Um, I, I'm just blown away by what you've been able to do with these uh, agent-based LLMs, and it, it's really powerful. And I see there's a lot of value in making them more and more realistic, like humans. And as a social scientist, there's a lot we can do, uh, completing surveys, et cetera. And that's an interesting path. But in the spirit of the Turing trap, I also want to encourage you to think about what are the things that these agents can do that none of us humans could do, and what might that mean? Could we have them meet in Congress and spend 1,000 or 10,000 years deliberating different uh, policies in, in and, and, and consider, OK, how could we solve immigration, tax policy, et cetera? And what about if we tweak them so that we were um, working more cooperatively or less cooperatively? I imagine that there's a huge space that has not yet been explored. We humans are not capable of exploring um, in any reasonable amount of time. But the agents could, could explore that space and then come to us to, to ratify. And you could do similar things in business and marketing, lots of others. So these agents, we can try to make them more and more like us, which is definitely intellectually interesting. Or, and I should say, and we could make them do things that are entirely different. And that is more of an engineer's mindset that allows us to expand the set of possibilities. So I hope you'll pursue that second path as well. I love it, yeah. Can I just put, put a voice to what everybody in the audience just thought? Can they elect a speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Something people cannot do. Apparently humans can't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's, so, it's beyond us. It's just like, yeah. So, so maybe I can uh, build on that. So actually, recently, uh, June was giving a talk, and, and a colleague, uh, Stephen Cow, asked us a great question. So June was talking about how his work could be used for economic policy if the simulations were good enough. And uh, Stephen asked, uh, well, why don't you ask an economist? So, so we have an economist here. Um, so Eric, for uh, you know, the, the standard you might imagine for economic policy research, you know, how good would the simulations have to be? And then June, how far are we from it? Right. I, I think actually this could be this is hugely valuable, and I think the Federal Reserve, I think for that matter, the private sector, when they you know have focus groups, when they try to understand how the economy is likely to respond to different actions, um, it's this is super. In fact, I'm going to be using it to do some GDP B measurement, that, and, and I think you've been talking to some of my uh, my uh, the postdocs who are working with me on that. So it's very useful for that kind of prediction. But again, there is there is a a, a less popular group of economists uh, <laughs> that talk about economics as engineering. Or, or one was, there was one paper, I forget who was by, who said, like, if economists could be as successful as dentists, that would be awesome, where they're like doing something constructive. Um, and and that, is, uh, that is not as big a part of the profession, but it's one where they are going, you know, they're, they're fixing things and doing things beyond that. So again, it, it's not just about more and more accurately simulating what we're doing, but it's allowing us to discover new possibilities that we haven't seen before. So I, I, the first part is a stepping stone to the second part. Can, can I say, oh, actually, no, you were going to respond. I saw, let me. Yeah. Or, uh, June, go ahead, or, or either of you go, go ahead. I, I was going to say, one of the things we found in doing prompt-based uh, virtual reality generation is that it inherently, this was unexpectedly grounded some of our language-based interactions about the human scale environment and vastly improved their reliability. Uh, so there's a funny way, like if, if you say large language models combine what people said about something rather than representing the thing directly, as soon as it's almost like you can't help but ground them and get better results once you start tying it in to some to some sort of uh, simulated model that has some sort of 
rules of consistency and continuity. Um, in our case, it was uh, the immediate real world of the person. In your case, it's a little town. But in either case, I think this is a path, uh, one of the really important path forwards for um, improving just the performance of these models. Uh, just quickly add on here, I think the sort of second question to reach this question was basically how far along are we? And for that, I think I'll just answer with basically the answer I already gave. We're deeply interested in this idea of accuracy. There's a huge, now a small community of researchers who are looking into this problem space. But sort of a, responding to maybe a tangential, tangential question here, I do think this is a space where we gain a lot of value by collaborating in an interdisciplinary manner. So we are obviously, I'm situated in the computer science department, but ultimately I think the people with the expertise to really leverage these techniques are not necessarily us, but the social scientists who are doing the work of actually finding new social science theories and proving them. So I think I, to some extent, see my role in that particular domain as somebody who's trying to empower social scientists to do new types of studies. And ultimately, I think it's going to, the real, the real power of these methods really going to come from collaboration with social scientists, economists, who are really looking into the problems that we might not know about as computer scientists. And I sort of echo sort of the general sentiment that's being presented here where, you know, I, I think step one of using these kind of techniques is to show that we can replicate existing types of studies that we've been able to run. I think that's the right first step because that sort of helps prove out the space. But ultimately, I think the real opportunity here is actually going to come from us being able to do new types of science that just was not possible before. So one type of example that I'm particularly intrigued by is, I think this sort of gets at what, Eric, maybe what you're alluding to is this idea of running counterfactual experiments mm -hmm. or multiverse experiments where we humans cannot truly run counterfactuals in the sense that we cannot forget things that happen to us. So there's always a learning experience. We can sample different population and we have techniques for really rigorous sampling. But to some extent, it is limited. But with these agents, we can actually wipe out their memory and truly run a new counterfactual experiments on top of, you know, based on new interventions and new environment. And I think that's going to open up a new genre in doing social science that will augment and sort of empower existing methods, not necessarily replace them, but empower them to expand what we can study in this space. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I mean, that's an optimistic view, and I, and I like it, but I want to bring in what Ashley was saying and, and the, the concern that also the agent-based systems could inadvertently lead to more and more of a monoculture, and, and the randomization is one technique, but I'd be curious what your other thoughts are about the ways this could turn bad um, and some of the things to pitfalls and some of the ways we could uh, mitigate those risks? Yeah, I don't really think we have really good theories of social interaction at an individual scale. We have a lot of ideas about what happens in the aggregate. And my hesitancy is just more we need really good existing laws, so to speak, in order to run these simulations about individual interaction and different values people are bringing to different contexts. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'd be really interesting to see what unfolds. I'm just uh, a little bit uh, hesitant to ascribe anything, you know, to the social world that maybe even social scientists themselves don't really, you know, understand, but are studying perhaps just with data. Maybe let me jump in there. So as you brought up values, I mean, here in Silicon Valley, we hear a lot of this concept of aligning uh, AI systems to values uh, mm -hmm. and whose values and things like this. And uh, recently, we've seen this um, flurry of interest in sort of trying to elicit values democratically, per se, um, and, and how we might think about that. So seeing as values come out in all four of your works in different ways, you know, how, what do you think about this entire sort of a topic of alignment and, in particular, democratic processes by which we might elicit values, or what do you think of that? A general, like value elicitation. I haven't thought as carefully about that. I definitely, I definitely think that uh, having the engineer, the designer, uh, have a good awareness about what values are in mind during the design process and communicating that is a definitely a great start. In terms of how we should 
automatically bake it into whatever system or if there's some systemiza systemization, sorry, that we should provide to this, I'm not quite sure. Um, I haven't thought of as much about that. But maybe others on the panel have more well, I'll build on, what, on your work, which, which is that, I mean, uh, and you mentioned the virtues of capitalism. One of the nice things about capitalism is that there's let's, a thousand dollars. People can try things, and, and a lot of them fail, and different companies can hire people, and they have used different criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's sometimes a temp temptation of, of engineers and scientists say, oh, let's optimize this whole thing. Let's come up with the, you know, the best possible solution. Mm -hmm. And you know, th that's great. But one of the things that's underappreciated is the value of variety Absolutely. and diversity. And that, that um, so much of the, the successes in our society have come from mistakes and from people doing things that we didn't expect and from people taking a, a, a different path, like you know, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple likes to talk about, et cetera. But, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and, a, and a good system will have like multiple ways of succeeding and it, it won't have a, a, a monoculture or a, an overarching optimized system that, um, that gives you the one best solution. That might be good in a static sense, but I think it's always gonna fail uh, dynamically. Definitely. And sort of one thing I sort of add here, I think it, this is an extremely important point, especially as we sort of delve into this area, which is, Basically, who are these models and agents actually representing? Like, who is ChatGPT? And it's sort of an aggregate representation of the web, but it's not attached to any particular person. So when we use these models to run social science experiments and in, in this kind of policy making, I think a really important question that we as a field will have to answer is who is these agents and model representing and where are we failing? I think being very rigorous about knowing where it fails and who it represents and being able to have some control over maintaining that we're making sure that we're representing a diverse group of people, I think it's not going to be sort of an additional thing that we'll have to, but I think it's going to be a central thing that we'll have to get right for this to really settle down as a method of doing science. Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing I'll, I'll add to that is uh, if you want the benefits of a very large model, but you don't want a monoculture and you want to have diversity in the outputs of it, there is exactly one solution that's equivalent to that spec, which is data dignity, which is to be able to selectively use portions of it in different settings so that you can use it in a, with, with a diverse input. I mean, there's, there's really logically no other way to do that. And uh, so I think that a side effect of what we're building might help address the question you brought up. So I, I want to go back to something you brought up in your talk as well, which is about a value, not values here. Um, so on who accrues value in this entire new setup we're seeing with generative AI, it's come out throughout many of the conversations here, right? Whether we're thinking about the data creators on one end of the spectrum and the applications on the other. Um, and so you know, first, there's a question of who currently is accruing value. And perhaps more importantly, how do we want to change that system if we do? You know, here I think of... Uh, Angus Deaton's work, uh, the Nobel laureate, about pre-distribution and redistribution, and how do we think about those things? So mm -hmm. again, I'm sure all of you have different thoughts, but maybe we can start with Eric there. Sure. Well, I want to very much second one of the things that, that Jerome, Jerome said a little bit earlier about um, UBI, uh, um, as, as the technology gets more powerful and creates a lot of wealth, maybe there's less need to work. And uh, I think, from a, again, from a static sense, it might be very tempting to say, okay, let's just have uh, distribute the, the gains to everybody. I fear, as Angus Deaton and others have pointed out, that that kind of redistribution ex post, it puts a lot of power in the people who have accumulated that wealth up front. And we hope they're going to be benevolent. Um, a lot of them, I've met some of them, and they seem very like nice people, um, nice men mostly. Um, but, but I'm not sure that we can sustain that, that they will always, or whoever succeeds them, their, you know, their successors, will always be that generous. And so the pre-distribution idea is that you give bargaining power, you distribute bargaining power widely. You don't have a monoculture. You don't have all the uh, technology uh, centrally controlled and owned. And you make sure that individuals are still indispensable to creating value. And if you try to structure the society in that way, then they will naturally accrue some of the benefits. They'll have data ownership. They'll have ownership of, of the knowledge. And um, there are a, a myriad different ways of setting the rules of the game. It's not like there's just one way to structure society. We see all sorts of them in, that, that exist on the earth right now, not to mention m numerous other ones that haven't been implemented yet. And I think we should, there should be an agenda to think about 
how can we create a set of property rights and other rules that make it more likely we're going to have that kind of pre-distribution where uh, economic and therefore political power is widely distributed, assuming I think most of us would prefer that kind of a world to one where it's centrally controlled and then we rely on benevolence to distribute the gains. And, and that, that just seems riskier. Well, I would say there's another reason to prefer more, a more broad distribution of benefits, which is um, it suggests an open economy that's growing rather than a closed economy in which uh, a zero-sum economy. Mm -hmm. It suggests a non-zero-sum concept of the world, and I want to live in a non-zero-sum world. Uh, there's a tendency in technical culture to want to be idealistic, to want the optimal solution, to say, okay, this is the way things should run, this is the ideal thing. And occasionally when I've been at conferences on these ideas, like how to implement plurality, we'll say, somebody will say, well, just tell me what the ideal plural system is and we'll put it in an algorithm and then build a network that way and then you'll have it. And it's not, it can't be that way. There has to be a somewhat messy and unknowable jumble of things because that's the only way to avoid concentrations of power. Uh, and I mean, I think one of the great values of money as a system is what it forgets. That you don't really know exactly why somebody made a decision to buy your thing or not. You don't, and you shouldn't know. Like there's a, there's a degree of enforced mystery in the very idea of money that I, I actually think is beneficial to us. And I, um, I, I get my dream, just I wanna say my dream is for computer science to become Keynesian. Um, and so, like, just like, <laughs> is that a laugh line? Uh, okay, I'll take it. Uh, uh, I, I, I want us to have levers of regulating without micromanagement of our information systems. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can build that, it's just that we haven't. Great, uh, maybe we can jump to the audience. Uh, so if there are any questions in the audience, maybe we can start here in the front. Thanks so much. So exciting. A question regarding the generative agents and the concept of times, right? Because these agents, they have some capabilities that we don't. For example, how fast they can calculate something that we cannot. And they can assemble a paragraph in second as we cannot. Whereas we can do something they cannot. And back to the question that if we want to sort of design an experiment, you know, in any domain, that what is the concept of time here? And how do you really regulate them? The concept how of what? Time. Time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for example, we sleep and dream overnight and then we build some idea, we complement that process. How it happened for those agents? I'm just kind of curious and also could be a question, I don't know. Right, so I think the question here is about the concept of time. <clears throat> sort of how, if I understand your question right, it's really the question of how do these agents and Asian community experience time and how do they sort of differ with the world that we live in? Is that right? Because you need them the ability to kind of have the same amount of time as you need to process right. a thought or just let them be really computer and then do a task in a second rather than a week or so. Right, well, so I think ultimately that's something that we can control. And sort of the way I look at it is if, if you may have sort of played a game, uh, almost any kind of game, there is usually a time of internal system time. So these agents, let's say one game step in the simulation is maybe 10 seconds of their world. And at each 10 second interval, they can make reasoning about certain things. So we can basically pace the simulation so that it would match our reality so if we are simulating something in real time or something for modeling a real time environment, then we can actually match the simulation so that these agents are not in superhuman that way. Um, now, if you want to model, for instance, organizations or bigger macroeconomic scale simulations, for those kind of things, you might actually want to fast forward the time a little bit so that you don't have to simulate every single day, but you're really simulating macro level, like year by year, what's going to happen. So that's a con the lever that we have to control these simulations. I do think that there's a broader questions to be had though about what are these agents capable of and how are their capacity actually different? It's sort of tangential to the question you're asking, but for instance, these agents, 
if you ask them to speak in French, Korean, English, they'll just be able to do that. And not many people can speak that many languages. But these agents are able to do that because they're language models and they might not disagree when they're prompted to speak in certain languages. It's, that's one example of that's not an entirely believable behavior because these models encode much more knowledge than what a person might. And controlling for that is still a challenge. So I think that's something that we'll have to delve into in the future. Okay, another question. Yeah. There is an abundance of agents that is limited to humans, right? So suddenly if you go into a multi-agent environment and I can, on, on, on demand and on command, yeah. start creating a variety of tasks and have that in an augmented environment of my real world, virtual augmented reality as an interface, virtual reality as an interface, so human and machine is always going to merge with the coin. There's an abundance equation here. It's not a scarcity. So it's a brand new economics. I don't even think it's classical economics to begin with. So is there a first principles way of even rethinking economics fundamentally? Because I can envision an eight in a trillion population environment with an agent phenomena from a simulator versus only eight billion humans in flesh and blood in a biological system. So we are extending our capabilities of biological system into another other realm and it changes the equation. So how do we even apply economics? And what does even economics mean in this equation when I can go create my own abundance? You can go create who's really competing um, of both production and you know, creation and everything else. Like what, are, what is your take on? Because the viability is amazing. Uh, since it's a more utopian than dystopian. Eric? So I think there's something fundamentally different about this than anything that, that we've seen. Alex, I'll be brief because we don't have an abundance of time. Um, and so one definition of economics is the study of scarcity. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. That needs to be fundamentally rethought. Um, there's a lot of abundance that we didn't have before. But I don't think it's an abundance of everything. And so what I'm trying to ask myself and, and all of us is, is, is in this world where some things become very abundant in a digital world, what, if anything, remains scarce? You know, maybe human attention, maybe status, maybe there's some other, maybe compute time. I don't know. There are some things that may still become, still be scarce or become relatively scarce more. And then the economics is going to center around them. So it will be a fundamental rethinking of economics, but it'll be asking that question, what is abundant and what now is scarce? So maybe let me take a question from online. So uh, this is directed to Aisha. Uh, have you seen conversations of algorithmic pluralism outside of the academic space? In Congress, corporate, and if so, what is the current state of thought? Yeah, I mean, much of our legal apparatus actually moves to you know, take action when there is a form of severity, when there is an over-concentration um, in decision-making processes. So um, as an example, the ban to box, the box movement where you, know, you could use a person's credit history or criminal history um, in employment decisions. Uh, a lot of these things were decided based on how pervasive this was and how much that limited opportunity. And so I actually think in practice, when you at least see, and Congress doesn't move much, <laughs> but when they do move um, to ensure uh, these opportunities that are equal, it's mostly based on severity-based cases. And so actually part of situating what might come in this framework is also to say we have ways of responding to these kinds of concerns legally um, as well as in, in other ways. So, yeah. Uh, I wanted to say in terms of uh, this sort of topic in the world outside of the academic world, even the tech industry, the resolution of the writer strike in Hollywood was the first major labor action that took AI into account. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel pretty good about how it went. Uh, and I, uh, I, uh, I, it wasn't like anti-AI or anti-tech at all. It was uh, seeking compensation and ex uh, explicitly informed by the idea of data dignity, if you look at the writing by some of the key people in it, and uh, I feel pretty good about it. I think it's a good precedent. I think we're very lucky with how it turned out, and I, d I don't think the entertainment industry is gonna suffer as a result. I think they'll do better. Okay, so taking another question quickly from the online uh, audience. Um, over time, will AI get trained on its own output, and what are the ramifications? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just laughing, because, I mean, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, obviously, it's not. We're, 
trying to avoid that and a number of other things. Uh, it's very possible for us to do our job badly. We, we have that option. <laughs> but perhaps we will not take that option. Okay, maybe the last uh, question. Um, yeah, yep. Hi. Hi, thank you all for sharing your perspectives. Um, this is maybe more for, particularly for Jerome. Um, if, uh, so when we collaborate with another party, usually it's on a, we mean on a fairly level playing field. Uh, if t uh, AI is indeed a tool and not a creation, then how would one reframe the idea of collaboration and a team to acknowledge that asymmetry, and in particular in making sure that the human being doesn't become the tool? Well, uh, I mean, this is uh, part of what we're all here to work out. We have to figure out the answer to that question, and I don't think anyone in this room has a complete answer, but um, I think one level is economic, where uh, some of the same creative people who might be uh, working with an AI in the loop in some manner actually get royalties from having provided great data for improving the AI in its last training cycle. Uh, it might come from uh, metrics that help uh, determine when something ridiculous is happening. It might happen through taxation. It, it might happen through policy. Um, a lot of it might happen through the intelligence and goodwill of the engineers and scientists at the tech companies that make the thing available, which is one of the reasons why meetings like this are so important. Okay, so with that, we'll end the session and go for a brief break.